Hi there, I'm Pamela Clark. I used to work at the Weekly for 50 years and I ran the test kitchen and I worked on their cookbooks and I got to learn a lot about a lot of things, but in particular fruitcakes, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Come Christmas time, around the end of October, November, the phones rang hot and in later years the emails were uh, lengthy and um, prolific. And we got so many questions about fruitcakes, the recipes themselves, uh, variations on the recipes, how much, how many people a fruitcake would serve, how to store them, how to cook them. It went on and on. So after all that time, I got to know a fair bit about fruitcakes and I do love making them. I make a lot of them. So I'm going to show you how to make a, a rich, traditional, basic fruit cake, and I'll come to the recipe a bit later. But I really worry about cake pans. A lot of recipes uh, don't give you specific sizes for uh, a particular fruit cake. They'll just say a 20 centimetre cake pan. Now, a 20 centimetre cake pan of a square shape is right for a 250 gram butter recipe. So is a 23 centimetre a round cake pan, right for that quantity of fruit cake. And people do get confused. They think that a 20 centimetre pan can be either round or square. No, no, it can't. It, if it's 20 centimetres square, it holds a certain amount of mixture. If it's 20 centimetre round, it holds much less mixture. And if you put the 20 centimetre square mixture into the round, it's going to be very deep and it's going to take a long time to cook through and it won't cook through properly. It will either be doughy in the middle, burnt on the top, burnt around the sides, dried out. And this, is, this happens a lot. So a 20 centimetre square cake pan is the way to go for a 250 gram butter, amount of butter, the old money, half a pound of butter. And, uh, or if you want to make a round cake pan, that will be a 23 centimetre or a nine inch cake pan. But both of them will work perfectly with a quantity that has 250 grams of butter. So I personally like aluminium cake pans. You could, you, they're pretty hard to find now, but if you have any old ones, don't let them out of your sight because they definitely cook cakes the best, in my opinion. Uh, the way aluminium conducts heat is more even than any other kind of product that I know. Some of the more modern cake pans are very heavy and they've got the dark interiors and this means that the cakes take a shorter time to cook but they get a bigger crust and they're often overbrown and dried out. So if you're going to use those cake pans with the the heavy lining inside, and they're actually usually very weighty. Sometimes they're grey, sometimes they're black. Uh, drop the temperature down, and I'll tell you more about that later on. But first and foremost, you need to know how to line a cake pan correctly. And this is particularly important if you're going to decorate the cake in any way, or you want it to look just neat, neat and tidy in shape. So um, it's important that you spend a little bit of time making the lining correct. I'll show you the cheats way first, just for fun, because this is what I do if I'm making a boil fruit cake and I'm not worried too much. Um, just get a strip of paper that you know is going to come up the side of the cake in a pan and stand up a little bit, and then just fold paper over. Give the pan a bit of a spray with the oil all around the inside here, particularly the corners, because you're not going to be covering those corners this lazy way. So you put a strip in that way, and then another strip the other way. And that's that's the cheats way. Now that's not good enough for a Christmas cake, but you want to look neat and tidy. So the first thing you do is take a length of glad bake that is going to wrap around the cake pan. A little bit of just work here. And fold it in half, lengthwise of course. 
and try and get the uh, uh, pleat here nice and sharp. I just generally pull them over the side of the bench and it just makes, makes a nice sharp edge. Then I split that using a knife or scissors, whatever you prefer. Quite like using a knife, maybe on the edge. And that'll give you a double layer of, of lining. I don't think you need any more with the cake that's going to take about three hours to cook. If you're going to make a larger cake, uh, say a 10 inch cake or a 25, 30 centimetres, I'm old enough that I'm in both metric and um, imperial weights and measures, so I tend to use both. Um, just Fold a little bit up on the edge here of the paper. Get a good grip on it because this glad paper is mighty slippery. But just get a good grip. And then once again, a nice sharp edge there. It just make life easier for the rest. Okay. Now with scissors, a snip along there so that the paper will fit neatly into the round corners of the cake pan. And this same method we use for round cake pans, oval, just about any shape you can imagine. This makes it neat and tidy. Just flatten that out oh, a little bit. You see what I mean about that? Slippery glad bag, but it's wonderful stuff. I love it. Put that into the pan. Tend to keep the, the the two ends away from the corners of the pan. Push the little cut bits down. If they define you, you take over and you're a boss of the cut bits. You see what I mean? And then let's use this piece of paper. We need a couple of layers of glad bag. To cover the base. This might look like I'm fussing around with it, but honestly, it's it's worth a little bit of effort. It doesn't take that long. You get a good grip on that piece of paper because, as you know, it slips and cut inside the marked area. Obviously, because you've got the side of the tin to contend with. Go just inside, just a, just a little bit inside, not much. Okay, now that fits neatly over the base of the panel. Whoops, a little, little bit of an escape room here. Okay, so there you have it, neatly lined and ready for the cake mixture. Let's assume that you've got everything ready to go. If you're going to soak fruit um, really overnight, doesn't cut the mustard. You really need to soak fruit to get any impact at all on the texture of the cake, and you really need to soak it for at least a week. So I am worried about soaking fruit with the alcohol and I've found experiments in the old test kitchen uh, that honestly the difference was hardly discernible. Probably the best advice that I could give you is to make the cake, finish it earlier, say in November or December and just wrap it up properly. I'll tell you more about that later. Wrap it up properly, store it properly and just let it rest. And that will give you the same result, if not better, than as if you bothered to soak the fruit and risk, the pe risk people stealing little bits of fruit from the mixture all the time. So let's assume everything's ready. You have to uh, preheat the oven. And the best position to cook a rich fruit cake in is in the centre of the oven, or so that, say, the top of the fruit cake is centred in the oven. 
With fan forced ovens, which are most ovens these days, it shouldn't make much difference, but I've definitely found that that centre position is the best. So make sure that your shelves are in position correctly. Sometimes if you preheat the oven, you don't even think about the shelves, you look in it and you've got them in all the wrong positions. So check that you can actually get the cake tin into the, into the oven without have touching a rack above it. So fix your shelves first and then preheat the oven. I generally, I've got a very wide oven as you can see, so I generally heat it to higher, a higher temperature than I actually want. So that when I put the cake in, I just turn it back immediately to a, a slow temperature, which is you know, 150, in the old money about 300 Fahrenheit. So 150 Celsius, and that should cook your cake perfectly, presuming that your oven temperature is accurate. If you're in doubt, buy yourself an oven thermometer and just leave it in the oven when, um, when you, to one side when you're cooking something and you, you, get, you get a fairly good idea of how accurate it is. So first you need to beat the butter, sugar and eggs together. Uh, a lot of people get very panicky about this process and they beat the butter or cream the butter for too long, in my opinion. You don't need to do that for a free cake. For a butter cake, a light fluffy butter cake, yes you do. But for a rich fruit cake, no, you don't. So I've, this is 250 grams of butter in here. It's regular supermarket generic butter salted, because if you look back in old recipes, most of the old recipes had a pinch or even more salt added. I don't bother with that, I just use salted butter. So you just beat that butter until it's just clinging around the sides of the bowl. I used a small bowl of this mix master because I want the beaters to get right down into the mixture. Tip all the brown sugar in, that's regular brown sugar. If you want to use the dark brown sugar, it gives you a slightly darker crumb. And that's good. I just didn't happen to have any today. So don't overbeat this mixture. Do not think that you're making uh, a, a regular butter cake. Basically, I've just combined that mixture. So you can see, just looking at the beaters, that it's barely mixed at all. So now we start adding the egg. Now that was really easy and quick, so you don't have to fuss. Providing the butter, is at room temperature and the eggs. Now this mixture takes 250 grams of butter will hold four to five eggs depending on the size of the eggs. If they're uh, small, it'll take uh, five eggs. If they're on the big side, it'll take uh, only four. And you, you know, when you look at the mixture, it's going to tolerate a, a last egg. Now I tend to add these eggs quickly so that the mixture doesn't curdle. If it does curdle, it's not the end of the world. I've had people phone and say, I've thrown the mixture out, it's curdled. Well, don't worry about it. Just give that a little bit of a scrape. If you have a large uh, mixture, uh, mixer I mean, you, you really don't have any choice with the size of the basin. But if you warm the basin so that the butter slips into the, back into the bottom of the bowl, it'll be absolutely fine. Just don't want that to go too far, otherwise it, it will, it will curdle at the last bit. But if those eggs are cold, you can imagine they're going on to probably room temperature butter. So of course they're cold, of course the mixture is going to split. So here's number five egg, live on the edge and put the fifth egg in. Go. Just go. Now if, if I continue to beat this too much, it will curdle. You just don't have to fuss with fruit cakes. They're very, very forgiving.
just to give it a tiny whip around and just give it a little bit more beating. And I'm very happy with that. No curdling in sight. So in this bowl, I've got a kilo of mixed fruit. Generally, I just buy the supermarket, the, the best of the supermarket uh, type mixed fruit. This one has cherries in it. And I've added 125 grams of prunes to that. Sometimes I do dates, sometimes prunes, sometimes a mix of both. Sometimes I add nuts, sometimes I don't bother. I actually prefer not to use nuts in a cake because often they'll interfere with the cutting of the cake. Um, so I, I tend to not use nuts. If I want nuts, I'll put them on top of the cake, but um, not in it. So that's ready to, to go. So in the bowl, in the big bowl, I've got a kilo of mixed fruit, 125 grams of dates. The recipe will be there for you to see, so don't worry about writing anything down yet. And also, you need a couple of tablespoons of jam uh, of any sort that you like. I happen to be using marmalade because I quite like orangey flavoured uh, cakes. What am I doing? Passing around with this. Actually, the easiest way is to do this. Presuming your fingers are clean. That does a very, very neat job. And in goes the creamed mixture in with the fruit. The order does not matter. Got a few going in there. Also, half a cup of alcohol, whatever you like. This happens to be sherry, simply because I had it, so that's going in there. A couple of tablespoons of the marmalade. Any berry jam, any jam, apricot, doesn't matter. Here's where it can get a bit messy, uh, particularly when you've got a hammer in front of you. So I'll just get a little bit prepared. That's uh, plain flour and self-raising flour. What I use a tiny bit of self-raising flour. The classic proportions are 250 grams of butter, 250 grams of sugar, 250 grams of flour. So with 250 grams of flour, I'd have 50 grams out of the plain flour and put in 50 grams of self-raising flour. This will all be on your recipe, just so that you've got it there in front of you. Um, the self-raising flour just adds a little bit of levity to the, to the cake mixture. Traditionally, rich fruit cakes don't have any raisin nature at all, so it's all plain flour. But I just like a little bit of a lift. I've got two teaspoons of mixed spice in there. You can use any spices that you like, combinations of nutmeg, cinnamon, whatever you like. It is, I think, important to sift because you can see I just tipped that spice on top of the flour when I measured it. And, you know, it stays in one, in one part of the flour. So I think it's important to mix the ingredients together. So now it gets the messy part. I found over the years that the most efficient implement for mixing a fruit cake is your hand. Presumably it's a clean hand and uh, no rings on because the mixture gets under the rings. It's not a nice feeling. So that's what I use it. But you've got to be ready because you're going to have um, get the cake get the pan near you, the flour near you, and away you go. So you see that by doing this, you can squeeze all the little lumps of 
group together and make sure that they're separate. And there's the sickly flowers and the spice. your hand once again. You can use the side of your hand uh, like a plate scraper if you like. I have a sister who is not a natural cook and when she saw me doing this many many years ago she said I can't watch you doing that it makes me sick <laughs> which really amused me but um, some people just don't like the feel of mixtures like this, whereas I, I like to get amongst them. Now, when it comes to putting the cake mixture into the pan, with a square pan, I tend to put dollops of the mixture into the corners just to weight the paper. So, one little dollop there. Don't use two hands because you never know, you might have to abandon the mixture and answer the phone or something. See what I'm doing? I'm just pushing the mixture into the corners. Whoops. It's not take long. I used to, back when I was making lots of fruit cakes, I used to claim that I could chop all the fruit, line the tin, and get that this quantity of fruit cake into the oven in 30 minutes. Probably a bit out of practice now. But once again, by using your hand, you can make sure that there are no big air bubbles or anything like that. Now, when it comes to making the cake flat on top, really, you don't have to be that fussy. If you're decorating the cake, um, it's great to have a flat top, but I cool the cakes upside down uh, so that the weight, its own weight, will flatten the top anyway. So I don't fuss too much. If you want to have nuts and cherries decorating the top, now is the time to see where you see. There, it's good. Now is the time to put them on top of the cake. See this mixture that I just got off my fingers? That is just pure cake mixture. If you leave that just in the center of the cake mixture, there it'll look a bit peculiar when the cake's cooked. So mix it up with the rest. Right, now I'm going to go and wash my hands before I put this cake in the oven. Just to give the cake a little bit of a settling, if you just drop the pan, not from a great height, there's no need, onto the bench a couple of times. It, the, the mixture is soft enough so that it does spread out into the corners. If you want to be really fussy, you can dip the spatula, cake, cake scrape or whatever, into water and then you can make this all lovely and level. But you know, you've got the heat of the oven that does make all of this lovely and soft. On the lining paper, there's a bit there because it will burn. It doesn't really matter, but anyway, looks better. So this goes into the oven and it'll take three hours, give or take 15 minutes, if the oven temperature is correct at 150. I generally look at the cake after about an hour and then another time in another hour. And, and sort of make a bit of a judgment call as to whether it's cooked or not. And uh, I'll show you how to test the cake later on. The cake took two and three quarter hours to cook. 
and how I make sure that it's cooked through properly. First, I open the oven door when I think it's about right, and I touch the top just in the middle, just lightly with your fingertips, and it feels firm. You can really tell the difference quite easily because otherwise it feels soft and a bit gooey in the middle. And if it's firm here, it's certainly going to be firm around the outside of the cake. So then I take it out of the oven, close the oven door, but leave the oven on just in case it's not cooked. And then I use a vegetable knife and I put the, it's hot of course, um, I put the knife into the cake about in the middle and trying to avoid any little cracks that are in the cake. Put it straight down to the bottom of the tin and then pull the knife out sort of slowly. And because you've got quite a broad area here to determine whether, you're, um, whether you've got raw cake mixture or whether you maybe just stab through a raisin or something, you can tell just by looking at it that in fact the cake is cooked. And if in doubt, you just run your finger along the blade and you can feel that there are tiny little crumbs in between your fingers. So it's done. If it wasn't done, I'd be putting it back in the oven. So now the oven's off, I'm happy. Then I take, I cut this paper off, just using a little, a little serrated knife, just to make life a bit easier for myself. All the way around. What you don't want is big pleats in the cake. That's really why I'm doing it. This, this particular proportion of fruit to the cake mixture was a bit light on with fruit, which is why it took only two and three quarter hours. You can go up to one and a half kilos of fruit, doesn't matter what it is, your call. Um, using the basis of 250 grams of butter. But this was only 1.125 of fruit. So that's why it took a little less time to cook. So just, just be mindful of that. I'm, I could have added glacé fruit of any kind, um, dates, anything, cranberries, doesn't really matter. It's just whatever you like. Ginger, of course, nuts, of course, include all of those. In the, um, in the count, but don't go over 1.5 kilos, otherwise it's just too much fruit to the amount of cake. Okay, now that's sherry, the same as I used in the cake. As I said before, if you want to use rum, that's fine, it's lovely. Brandy, liqueurs, it really doesn't matter. What, whatever you have and whatever you uh, whatever flavor you like. The alcohol cooks out during the time in the oven. Uh, so if people are, are not drinking any alcohol, they don't like it, they don't want to drink it, uh, you can still put it into a cake because the, the alcohol content is gone. Only the flavor remains. So this is the way I treat cakes. I peel that paper off, Put a piece of foil over the top and then I turn it onto the cake upside down onto a towel. In this case, I, I'm a bit of a fan of the nappies and I use them hot for things like this. So it's upside down, which means it's going to flatten the cake due to its own weight, keep it nice and level, and then I put Another layer on top, this way, that way. See how useful nappies are, not their original use. And I let that cool overnight. A cake like this takes 12 hours to cool down to room temperature. Get underneath here without burning the fingers off. Just move him right over there. And just leave them alone. Let them do their thing. Let them cool down. The little tiny cracks that appear in the top of the cake will go away completely. The cake will darken a little bit as it cools and it will all settle down and be really beautiful. So when the cake's cold, if you want, if you're going to make it and say, 
October, November, you do need to store it properly. So when it's cold, I take the uh, lining paper off, the foil off, wrap it in Glad Wrap quite thoroughly, and then put it into a container like Tupperware or even back into the cake tin and then put it in your fridge. You can freeze them, but I just don't see the necessity at all. In fact, I quite like cakes cut cold from the fridge. By the time you've cut them, and they cut like butter because they're cold, um, by the time you eat them, they're just coming to room temperature. And that's the way I like to serve fruit cake. Anyway, it's up to you really. But that's the way I keep them and it works a treat. I've kept them for a year um, in the fridge. Really the only reason you're keeping them in the fridge is in case the insects move in, which in Sydney, as you know, the little ants can come calling and they do like the odd piece of fruit cake. So that's all I've got to say about making a fruit cake for now. And uh, I'll see you all next week.